influence in the slideshow. Our, All right, Esther. All right. Well, my here. cursor, my cursor has gone missing. So now it's back. Um, so I want to start with a question, which is how many of you feel like you are highly influential now? Just put it in the chat if you feel like you're highly influential. Or not. Depends on the day. No, sometimes, somewhat, kind of. Not enough. Yeah, so, so the next question is, because we're seeing a lot of people who feel like, oh, sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not, maybe more, could be better. Um, how comfortable are you with influence on a scale from one being not at all comfortable to five being comfortable? How comfortable are you with influence? So this is interesting because we're getting a lot of fours and fives, even though people may have not have felt like they were um, so good at it. Okay, someone's a nine. Okay, on a scale of one to five, you're a nine. Okay, um, that's interesting. So I'm going to endeavor to share my screen. Five was high. Five was one was low, five was high. So maybe maybe our reading is off. Okay, so I'm gonna try to share my screen and this might involve some futzing. <sighs> As such things go. So far. All right, I'm gonna did I share the right screen? You did. It looks perfect. Yay me, I get a gold nice star today. Um, now let's see if I can see the chat at the same time. Nope, doesn't want to let me see the chat. So if anything interesting we'll, comes up, you're going to have to tell me. We'll keep you, we'll keep you posted. Keep me no. posted. So um, here's yet another question. What comes up for you when you hear the term influence? What associations does that have for you? Someone said manipulation, leadership, mm -hmm. more leadership, sales, impact, knowledge, change agent, power, inspiration, change. Changing mindsets and behavior, leading by example, importance, leadership, inspiration, decision making. Half Nelson. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're impact and creating change. Yeah, yeah. we we have um, a lot of associations with influence, some of which are um, positive and some of which are not. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what influence is not, um, at least in the way I talk about it and the way I uh, try to use it. So influence is not the same as politics, you know, office politics, which might be about self-promotion or pressure or playing one group off another, uh, creating factions, um, gatekeeping. It's not about that. That's not what influence is about. It's not about politics. It's also not about persuasion. Now, sometimes people think um, influence is the ability to talk other people into doing things. There are some real limits with persuasion. There's real limits to what we can accomplish. Um, on one hand, it's like, you know, if you win the argument, you lose, and you lose the argument, you lose. Well, why is it that you lose the argument even if you, you know, so called win it? Um, there's this whole theory about uh, self determination and autonomy. And essentially, it says that. When you uh, 
tell someone what to do or when you win an argument and they feel like they have to do what you're saying, even though it would be their choice, they lose autonomy. And when people lose autonomy, they try to regain autonomy. They try to regain some semblance of their autonomy. Um, in psycho psychological terms, it's called reactance. So they may comply on the surface. Um, they may kind of, you know, act out. They may do a lot of things. But what they're really trying to do is retain autonomy. And influence is not manipulation. So manipulation is trying to get somebody to do something that you want them to do that may not be in their best interests. Uh, and generally, if you are trying to manipulate someone, you have to hide that motive. You have to hide your motive, right? You can't come up and say, I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to use these tactics to get you to do this thing that I want you to do that you might not, not be good for you. But with, manip with, with influence, you can actually be straightforward and say, you know, I'm trying to um, shift your opinion on this. And I, I hope that, uh, you know, I can, I can um, find a mutual purpose. You know, so you can actually say what you're doing. Um, I, you know, it's not necessary to announce it, necess it from the get go necessarily, but it's not something you have to hide. So I define influence is, as the power or capacity of causing an effect in indirect or intangible means. So I'm wondering how that lands with people. I'm wondering how that sits, sits with you given what influence is not and what some of your initial responses were to what, what the term brings up for you. Any responses? Someone said they're wondering about indirect. Someone asked that we post um, the definition, so I'm doing that. The power or capacity of causing an effect in indirect or intangible ways. Sounds frustrating, no evidence of cause and effect. Well, Yes and no. I mean, sometimes we can see an influence because sometimes uh, that so, see the direct causation. Um, if we've had a conversation about mutual purpose and someone agrees to help us further a goal, right? So it can be direct, and sometimes it is very indirect. So we'll we'll talk about that too. Any other responses? So we got, is this like causing inception that the idea becomes theirs? We have a follow-up about why intangible and really like the use of power in definition, it involves a lot of personal power. Yeah, so um, let's see if I can remember all those questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is my short-term memory like today? Um, can you repeat the first question for sure. me? Sure. The first one, is it like causing inception, like the idea becomes theirs? Um, sometimes, sometimes, but not always. Uh, I, think, I think the um, influence part around that is related to what I call the fingerprint principle, which is people are much more likely to want to engage in something and own something if they can get their own fingerprints on it. So they're involved in the, you know, the, the development of an idea or they're involved in refining it and, and how it's implemented. So I think there's a relationship there. And I think you will probably be more influential if you do let people get their fingerprints on stuff. So it's not just, you know, Here's what I want you to do and do it this way, right? Um, what was the second question? Um, I think it was just more of a comment, but we did get a couple of more questions. Um, isn't it more the power or capacity, but the actual exertion of energy and it's received by the person who was potentially influenced? That makes sense. So um, like Sally was influenced by peer pressure as an example. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Well, we aren't talking we aren't talking directly about peer pressure here, but this is another interesting thing about influence because we are all very much influenced by our social networks and um, by peer pressure. Uh, there's some research that shows that um, all sorts of behaviors are influenced by what is considered acceptable in our social networks, like, you know, what it's appropriate to eat, um, whether we smoke or not, um, how we treat um, uh, petty uh, theft, you know, all sorts of things are influenced by what's considered acceptable in our social network. So that definitely influences us is in life. Um, I think what I'm talking more about here is intentional influence. Right. Um, you know, if you if you if you think about it, this just popped into my head now, but, you know, one of the um, one of the things that happens when people go to AA is that they often um, bond quite closely to that group. And some groups have places where you can just go hang out. And what that essentially is doing is creating a new social network where there's a different standard for acceptable use of alcohol. So it's very influential in that way. Um, was there another question? There was a couple more comments, a little bit of questions. Um, it's like the idea becomes theirs, but if a new version could come up as a discussion, um, as part of the discussion of influence um, and also influencing by offering, I guess, like your idea and empowering people to take it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I will, I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, yeah, so, so let's talk about where influence comes from, because I think that might be illuminating at this point. Um, very traditionally, we think about influence, particularly in organizations coming from sort of a handful of sources that in some ways correspond to power, right? You know, it can, it can come from your legitimate authority. You have a management role that's going to influence people around you because of the dynamics of the power involved in that role. As a manager, you can set salaries, you can assign things, you can fire people. So that definitely influence is going to influence how people act upon you. Um, recognized expertise. We often follow the lead of people who we regard as experts. Um, access to information or relationships uh, can be a source of influence. Charisma can be a source of influence. Um, you know, you think about all of the Instagram influencers who have a certain amount of charisma and they are influencing people for good or for ill. Right, there's a downside to it, but it is certainly a source of influence. A very, it can be very diffuse, or it can actually be very direct, right? Based on your charisma, you're, if you're a, you know, a big influencer and you tell people to go eat Tide Pods, they may go eat <laughs> Tide Pods. <laughs> that, that was a thing a few years ago that that um, some people were. Recommending you go do that, which is really a bad idea. It's a bad idea. It's poisonous. <laughs> it's poisonous. Do not eat Tide, pad, tide Pods. Um, and now, of course, because of, of reactants, uh, if I tell someone not to eat Tide Pods, they're going to say, You can't tell me what to do. You're not <laughs> possibly going to eat a Tide Pod. Don't, don't, don't make your own decision about that. Read the research. Um, Bending or breaking of the rules can be a source of influence because it helps get things done. You know, control of funding and control of rewards. These are all the very, very traditional um, things we think about when we think about influence. So I'm curious, how many of you feel like you have access to these sort of formal and traditional sources of power and influence? I miss seeing the chat directly. <laughs> Some people are saying they do.
I see the comments going up, but I can't hear you now. I'm sorry, it's because my dog started crazy, but someone oh. said almost all of them. They have access to a couple of them, um, maybe a few of these platformal <clears throat> positional ones. So relationship seems to be the biggest one. Okay. Um, you know, and in some ways, that's one of the most powerful on this list. Because if you are if you are influencing on the basis of your uh, legitimate authority, your management role, or because you have access to formal and informal rewards, or you have access to funding, um, you can get people to go along with you. You can create um, a, an effect through those means, which some are more tangible than others. But the best you're going to hope for in many cases is compliance. You know, you won't really get people who are enthusiastic about it. But if if your influence is based on relationship, you're more likely to, you know, have people actually be supportive and genuinely supportive in your influence. Um, relationship is an interesting thing uh, because we often think about relationship as personal connection, which it is. However, in the workplace, the way we approach things is highly mitigated by our role and the pressures we experience in that role and what we're responsible for in that role what success looks like in that role. So uh, I think it's super useful to think about that as well when you think about relationship and influence because it can feel very um, disappointing, uh, you know, almost like, a, sometimes almost like a betrayal if you, if you um, feel like you have a good connection with someone and then they are not willing to support you in something you're trying to influence. And it may have nothing to do with your personal connection. It may have to do with there is no mutual purpose there, given their role in the organization. I'm wondering if anyone's ever had that experience. Anyone ever had that experience of feeling like, oh, well, we have a connection. Of course, they'll support me. But then they don't. Yeah. Yeah, we're hearing some yeses. Someone yeah. also mentioned that um, we didn't mention fame as part of the influence, like being well known. Is that something that would be our traditional source of power or influence? I might, I might put that under charisma. Okay. We're getting yeses and offens and right nows in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I sometimes do when I am hoping to um, further some organizational goal. In a, in a company is I will actually sit down and consciously think about what role is this person in or what are the pressures they're experiencing in this role? What does success look like for them in this role? Um, you know, what are their priorities in this role? And then I can often talk about what I want to accomplish in a way that makes sense to them from their role. You know, and sometimes there is no mutual purpose, right? But sometimes, uh, you know, I, I can find a mutual purpose and talk about it in a way that makes sense in their role. Like um, a billion years ago when I, I was doing some work in a high dog, um, in a um, an IT department, and it, it, there was a, there's a bunch of software that was used by, you know, a few hundred agents who were you know, doing um, support calls for customers. And the the VP, <coughs> excuse me, didn't care about code quality at all. So we were trying to improve quality of the code. She didn't care about that. She cared about uptime. So anytime we wanted to gain her support for something, we had to frame it in terms of uptime. You know, if we had talked about um, um, you know, cohesion with the code, ease of maintainability, the elegance, or we had talked about any of that, wouldn't have mattered to her. So we talked about the impact of all of those things on, on what she cared about. 
And we could do that because we had thought about what mattered to her. So maybe make your idea about relationship a little more expansive and understand what the organizational um, impacts on relationship are. Uh, also having a lot of relationships can, can help with influence, can help a lot with influence when you have a lot of relationships um, because we can make introductions, right? Um, you may not be able to help with something, but maybe somebody else can. Um, I, you know, I, for example, I make a lot of introductions because I know a lot of people and it doesn't really cost me anything to do them, but it's helpful to someone else. So relationships work on a bunch of different levels. Um, so what happens if you don't have access to those traditional mechanisms for influence? Uh, you can still have a lot of influence uh, because of the very powerful social principle of reciprocity and exchange. Um, reciprocity is deeply embedded in most cultures that, you know, if I do something for you, you are likely to do something for me. Um, you know, and, and it exists on a very granular level and on a, on a larger level too. Like uh, we have all sorts of little social rituals to kind of balance that out. If somebody does something for you, like somebody holds the door for you, you say, thank you, right? So that's a small reciprocity, right? Someone opens the door, you say, thank you, which acknowledges them, right? Very, it's very deeply embedded in our cultures. Um, and this is another way that we can have influence. Um, so what are the things that you have that you can offer in terms of reciprocity? I think we often underestimate what we have, what we can, what we can offer and what will be important to other people. Um, you know, we can, we can involve ourselves in something. Uh, we can create opportunities for learning for someone, we can offer assistance. Like I just said, we can make introductions, share information. Sometimes just listening to people, you know, not, and exhibiting our understanding, you know, showing gratitude, all of recognition. All of these things are things that you can offer without positional power, without charisma, you know, just by being a human, right? Um, so. I uh, I make a lot of jam. I don't eat a lot of jam, but I give away a lot of jam. So every time I make a batch of jam, I give jam to my neighbors. And if I make a batch of cardamom buns, which are a, a very wonderful Swedish thing, um, I give some away. And I like that, I, uh, influenced by jam. That's, <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> yes, the power of jam, the power of jam. I have quite the rhubarb patch, so I make a lot oh. of rhubarb um, rhubarb variations on jam. So, um, uh, Andrea says bribery always works. Well, I don't think of it as bribery. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying if you do this, maybe I'll give you that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, I, I do something nice for my neighbors and they'll do something nice for me, like maybe help me with some snow. Um, so, I mean, we all do things like that. And, and, you know, for most people, this doesn't feel manipulative, right? I mean, you can do it in a manipulative way, I suppose, um, that you just kind of shower somebody with so many um, gifts that they feel obligated. Um, but you know, you can always also set a boundary around that and say no more gifts. Um, I did offer jam to the reclusive lady who lived used to live next door to me, and she said, I will accept this jar of jam, but don't ever bring me another. Because I will be obligated to you them. She was very clear about it. I didn't I didn't feel any obligation to it at all, but um apparently she did. Um, um Esther, we did get a question in the chat. Sure. Um, someone asked, um, I noticed that good questions are not on the list Did that come in somewhere else. And then that person followed up saying, it seems that understanding is more about restating or 
understand what a person said, but the asking good questions they were asking about. I think questions are a great way to influence. They're one of my favorite ways to influence, actually. Um, you know, by asking different questions, you get people thinking about different things. Uh, so I think they're they're actually an excellent way to to influence. Um, what was the second part of that? Just that um, someone had suggested maybe the questions were the same as understanding, and they hmm. thought they would be two different things. I think they're different. Um, but demonstrating to somebody that you understand their situation, I think, is a, a, a very good way to influence. I mean, particularly if you are coming in as um, someone who is hoping to make some change, which scrum masters often are, if you can demonstrate to people that you understand what their challenges are and what their situation is, rather than just coming in and saying, we're going to do the agile. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's very powerful. That's a, yeah. that's, you yeah, know, that's meeting people where they're at, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, once people feel like, oh, she gets us, or he gets us, or they get us, uh, they're going to be much more likely to be open to what you have to say, you know, because, you know, you have influenced them, they have been able to influence you, and then they will more likely to accept influence in return. Um, so, yeah, that sets up a really interesting reciprocity. And it's super powerful and it's super underestimated um, when we're going into change situations. Because well, we... I would read a question from the chat, but this is actually my question. Okay. Is, where does trust come in here, right? When, when it, in terms of influencing others? Um... Oh, in the next slide. Oh, well, look at that. I'm getting ahead of In a roundabout way. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the the items um, that I just talked about are sometimes referred to currencies of influence, right? Um, involved in an exchange. Um, there's some interesting work by Adam Grant in which he talks about givers, takers, and matchers. So I'll get to your question. Nope. Uh, I'm, not, nope. I'm not, I'm just taking a roundabout route. Um, so which do you think? Um, of givers, takers, and matchers. So givers are, you know, they'll just offer these sorts of, of, of support or currencies and takers will take it and matchers make sure everything's even. Which do you think are most influential? The givers, the takers, or the matchers? Just curious. We have matchers, givers, matchers, basically matchers and givers so far. Right. And that's where trust comes in. Mm. Right. So takers are the people that will be very happy to receive some support or some encouragement or some assistance or some visibility or, you know, whatever it is. But they are less likely to offer it to peers or to people who are below them in the hierarchy. They will offer it to people above them in the hierarchy, but they will not reciprocate to people who are peers or below them. And they very, very quickly lose trust. People figure that out pretty fast. Um, and they can uh, find themselves in you know, really um, uncomfortable situations through using that strategy. I mean, you know, in some cases they get turned in. Like, I think there was some of that happening with Enron. If any of you remember Enron, that mm -hmm. was a big financial scandal a number of years ago. Um, so trust definitely plays a part, right? And, and people who are always willing to accept some kind of support, uh, but are never willing to reciprocate, lose trust. So. It plays a part. Um, the research shows that givers are the most influential, assuming that they do not neglect their own needs and responsibilities in the act of giving. So there needs to be a boundary there. Um, 
but some of the in this particular um, research the people who were willing to do little things for people you know it's not going to take me more than five minutes it's not going to cost me a lot of money um i'll just do it because i know that sooner or later it will be reciprocated perhaps in ways that i can't imagine at this point those are the people who have the most influence so <clears throat> you have to be careful of your own time so that you're not, you know, doing stuff that ends up um, getting in the way of your own responsibilities or, you know, drains you dry or, you know, leaves you depleted. But uh, it's one of those, um, one of those resources that is not a finite, finite um return right because we, we can't always predict when something's gonna gonna be returned to us in a way we didn't expect right <clears throat> like i said i make lots of little introductions for people because you know i know a lot of people uh and you know occasionally just sort of out of the blue something will come back to me you know and i can't you know the the path might be quite long or it might have uh in terms of the number of hops or in terms of the number of months, but something really quite wonderful will come back, right? So it's, it's I think it's worth thinking about. Um, matchers, like I said, are the people who try to keep it, you know, quite matched up here. You know, well, you did this much for me, so I'm only gonna do that much for you. Um, you know, they have influence, but there are some limits to it. And again, it's a matter of boundaries, right? If you if you find yourself with a taker, then you want to set the boundary. But in general, uh, you know, if it's not if it's not uh, costing you, then it's generally worth um, spending some currency. So, what kind of questions are coming up? So far, I think we got um, all the questions. Yeah, there seem to be, you know, some comments like, you know, we shouldn't expect to give the expect, or we shouldn't give with the expectation of getting something in return. Um, givers have the benefit of karma. <laughs> oh yeah, karma comes up. Yeah. 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 Just that boundaries are important. Yep. Healthy boundaries, healthy boundaries. That might be a good yep. distinction. <clears throat> yes, healthy boundaries. Um, I think they're super important in that. Um, so if you if you have access to the traditional modes of influence, you know, be careful about how you choose to use them, which ones you choose to use. Um, so Going back to the idea of a manager having positional power, when I was a, a new manager, I thought I could actually use my positional power to get things done, and I was ever so wrong. Um, but, you know, particularly with the people who reported to me, I I had to use influence, right? I had to, you know, talk about what was in it for them. I had to. Um, think about how things looked from their perspectives. I had to accept their ideas and allow them to influence my ideas. I had to build relationships. I had to build trust. I had to show that I knew what I was doing. I had to show that I, you know, got what was going on with them. Um, and be very, very judicious in how I used those um, kind of heavy hammers of positional power to influence things. Um, I was much, much more likely to get good results when I, I relied on, you know, expertise, relationships, um, currencies, understanding the fingerprint principle, all of those other things. Um, so if you have them, still be very judicious about how you use them. Um, if you don't have them, you can still be influential based on the laws of reciprocity and exchange. You can still be extremely influential. Um, um, if you are uh, 
you know, if you are known as a straight shooter and you have good information and you make good decisions and you're helpful, people are going to be influenced by you, right? So, so your reputation there is going to matter. Um, and remember that giving is the most influential strategy, much, much more so than, than being a taker or a matcher. Um, Esther, someone just asked about the fingerprint principle. Oh, the, the fingerprint principle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that is the principle that people are much more likely to embrace some idea if they have, a, if they are able to shape it. So if you uh, think about, um, and I think this is super relevant to people who are in scrum master roles, who are, you know, by the definition of the role, kind of expected to come in and, you know, do the agile, um, do the scrum. And it's very prescriptive how you, how you do scrum, um, which doesn't allow people to get their fingerprints on it at all. And it's it can it can activate the reactants because people feel like, oh, you're telling me what to do. So so, you know, look for ways that you can build on what's working and let people shape the ideas, you know, even if they're not like perfectly by the book. Um, you may be much more likely to get people's agreement to try something if they have a hand in shaping it. Um, the other way this comes up a lot is I see people um, often, often the leaders in organizations spending a lot of time on a new policy and then they come out with their, you know, or a new change or whatever it is, they come out with their beautiful PowerPoint deck with, you know, it's all looks very polished and very finished. And mm -hmm. then they say, um, do you have any feedback? And it doesn't really look like there's any room for feedback mm -hmm. because it looks so mm -hmm. polished and so complete, right? So people are then reluctant because it doesn't look like there's anything to, you know, to influence to actually give input, which is often extremely important for some uh, uh, an initiative being successful because you can't know from one vantage point in an organization what all the local conditions are going to be so super important and then Esther uh, we do have a follow-up um does diplomacy play a key role in oops I just lost it for a second um in the giving taking and matching does diplomacy play a role in it um how are you defining diplomacy that's a good question and Ajari do you want to so I'm going to just come off mute and, and ask your question, maybe. Further. So um, thanks for taking the question, first of all. And my, my view was, how can we, without having to keep a balance sheet <laughs> of giving, taking, and matching on a day-to-day -day or situation-to-situation -situation basis, how can we keep it light and breezy and still reconcile well? Well, I think you gave part of the answer there. Don't keep a spreadsheet. Right. <laughs> Notice if somebody is is taking is is only a taker. Notice that. But you know, just um, be as free as you can be without depleting yourself. Um, and you know, I think of diplomacy as you know, in some ways, the art of reaching agreements. Um, and that always involves knowing what your own interests are, but also knowing what the other person's interests are. And working to find some some mutually beneficial agreement, and that goes back to understanding, right? So, um, and we also think about diplomatic as being um, um, saying things in a way that isn't likely to upset or offend people. You know, saying things in a way that they're most likely to um, be able to hear them. So, I mean, this may feel artificial, but it's also effective, right? You know, you can you can commute, you can you can be like uh, I'm just going to say whatever comes into my head, um, and that's fine. But but considering how the other person might hear it is going to make you more effective. Yeah, packaging. Thank you, thank you, Esther. Sure. Um, so 
we are all influencing all the time all the time, whether we want to or not, you know, whether I um, uh, smile and make small talk with the checkout person at the grocery store will have some maybe small influence on their day. You know, the way I choose to um, interact with uh, people that I run into in the course of the day is going to have influence. Um, you know, if we hear something and we make a an expression, that will influence people and in, in whether they're going to approach us again. Um, you know, all of all of this stuff is going on all the time. So we sh we would benefit by being aware and to the extent we can be intentional about it. I mean, we cannot. We cannot control how people are going to respond to us. They're just they're going to respond the way they respond, but we can to some extent control what we put out there. So in an organizational context, I think there are some really great ways to be influential. Um, you can model things. Like you don't have to tell people uh, what to do. You can model doing it. Uh, I think this is actually often really useful when you're trying to introduce a new idea. Like if you want people to try a Kanban board, start your own Kanban board and let them ask you questions about it. Um, you can insert ideas obliquely, like by saying, oh, I read this interesting article. I think it relates to what we're doing here and just share it with people. Um, someone asked about questions earlier. I think that is a great influencing technique is asking questions, asking different questions that focus people on a different aspect of the system. Uh, I find analogies are often influential, um, sometimes trying to explain a technical concept um, may not go over well, but you know, an analogy can help. Like uh, I might ask people, how many of you have more than one home improvement project going on right now? And you know, some people will put their hands up and then it's like, well, how much progress are you making on all of this? Well, not that much. And that can that can be an analogy for limiting whip, right? So there's all sorts of analogies you can use. Um, track and fan is a matter of noticing when something is going well and encouraging it. You know, giving it's like, it's, you think about it as a little flame and you fan that flame so it gets more air and it, it grows bigger. Um, that's another great way to influence is to just look at what's working and give it some, give it some love. So the, the thing, the thing, and this again goes back to, um, the question about trust is don't be skeezy. You know, don't be don't be the taker. Don't uh, confuse manipulation and influence. And you will find that you if you're intentional and aware about it, you can you can really um, get a lot done in organizations. Um, I want to share some resources with you. Um, which I think are useful about influence. So here they are. And I think we have a few more minutes for questions. Um, Esther, some are asking, would you be willing to share your slide deck um, with me and I can send it out to the group after? Um, I am willing to do that. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone has questions, just feel free to come off of mute and, and ask. We had one in there. How do you have more influence online? Some are asking to see the last slide again. Um, how can you have more influence with what? I didn't, I didn't it's hear that. Online. I'm sorry. Online. I still do. Online. 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 Oh, online. Thank you for clarifying. Um, what, tell me more about what you mean online. Oh, David just got this. Tell, say more about that, please. Hi. Um, just to be more of a, a thought leader and, and have people uh, take what you say seriously and take action 
mm. based on what you say. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I, you have to put your stuff out there. Right? So, you know, if you have a blog, you know, um, write down what you what you know and and uh, people will find it and read it and that will give you credibility um uh mastodon at one point i would have said twitter but now i would say mastodon you know get put your stuff out on mastodon or um spoutable um it's hard to say where the whole social media landscape is going to end up but that was a great way for people to build influence I mean, there are a ton of people who built a lot of influence on social media with um, with uh, Twitter, um, Instagram and Facebook, not so much within our, um, you know, our professional niche, but uh, it's certainly possible to 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 uh, put your stuff out there. Is that did I answer the question you were asking? uh yeah more or less it's just like what you're putting yourself uh your stuff out there but it's not getting a lot of traction so how to get more eyes more engagement more traction ask a question okay <laughs> so so um so so you write a little you know you write the, like a one sentence summary and then say i'm really curious if you've had this experience or um, I'd love to hear what you think about this or uh, what has been different for you in this and people because people are more likely to respond to a question. Um, the other thing is to give people something to say yes to, you know, it's always, you know, if they, can, if they can say yes to something, you know, uh, post a question and I'll answer it, you know, that's a, another way for people to say yes. Did that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Esther, if you had time for a really quick question, um, <clears throat> I was wondering, I was wondering if the factors which you listed in your slide for gaining more influence and becoming more influential, would those be the same factors that would help you get promoted and move up the career ladder? Because I, it seems like the people who are influential are also have the title, they have the, you know, the higher up title to go with it. So I was just wondering. Um. If you are able to accomplish organizational goals and people notice it, that will often help with promotions. However, I have seen plenty of people who did not have um, titles high in the organization who were extremely influential because they were well respected. You know, they had. Um, uh, were known for making good decisions. They were known for being honest, you know, some combination of these things. You know, they were known for their technical expertise. Um, they had good relationships with people. I have seen plenty of people without big titles be very, very influential in organizations. So it's a yes and. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I have seen people who have big titles who are really not influential at all. You know, they are not the people people go to for advice. They're not the people that um, are sought out for problem solving. Um, you know, I, I I have run across people who, if it, high in the organization, that if they say something's a good idea, everybody knows it's not. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It's so there are two different things. Like like you're saying, um, it's not synonymous. The title doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, you know in terms of influence? Well, you have positional power, you have right. that positional influence, but <clears throat> I actually think that's, you know, uh, the the last thing to rely on. If that's, if that's the only way you can get things done in an organization, then um, you're using a lot of, a lot of goodwill and a lot of, um, you know, relationship credit uh, when you could be getting things done in a much more effective way, you could be far more influential and be building relationships and building trust uh, if you used other methods. Thank and you I so think, much. 
I think if more people understood that, um, most organizations would be happier places. Do we have uh, time for more questions? Perhaps Jamie. Well, let's let's leave that up to Esther. How are you feeling? If you do you What's want to that? spend maybe five <laughs> more minutes, or just maybe take one or two more questions? And... Oh, the the big uh, the big uh, constraint around um, my time here is when do I get super hungry and need to go eat lunch? So <laughs> I can stay for a little while longer. So let's just do let's do let's do one or two more questions, and that way we can let Esther go and and have her lunch. Okay, then I will um, use the opportunity to ask. Um, how, uh, what is your approach in influencing people who likes to debate like endlessly around everything, really literally everything? Uh, uh, when it comes to Agile, when it comes to Scrum, when it comes to any decision. So maybe it can be a little bit of cultural because I, I do live in Netherlands. It's also cultural to older they are saying about everything it's like a, having a debate and then um, having uh, many arguments so to convince the other party um, not sure if you if you have met uh, those type of personalities but I'm really curious how to how what is your approach to influence them yeah I've met many people like that and 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 you know debating and arguing can be fun for some people and it can be fun for me, depending on the topic, but not always. So um, particularly if I'm in a group, um, what I sometimes do is I will just say at a certain point, well, let's just check and see what our agreement on this is. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, are we willing to try this? And very, very often, everyone will agree they're willing to try it but they've just spent the last you know hour arguing about minor points right because it's fun yeah. so um you know sometimes i'll just ask that you know are we in agreement that we can at least try this um because it 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 it's a little intervention on that argumentation cycle um I have also watched people argue about stuff for, you know, an hour or more. And, you know, by the end of the time, they have talked themselves into it, which is, is you know, gets back to the fingerprint principle and gets back to that whole persuasion thing. You know, they've talked themselves into it. I haven't talked them into it. Um, you know, so I sometimes, uh, depending on the situation, I'll let the argument go on because if it seems like they're kind of working through in a purposeful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it's worth a try. It's worth a try. So, Esther, yeah. we have a few more questions in chat, but I would like to propose this. How about, um, would you mind if I emailed you those two or three other questions and, um, and, and maybe you could email back an answer I could send out to the group? I would not mind that at all. Okay, that would be Actually, that would be wonderful. I'm wondering if I will be able to um save the chat file. I should be able to. If not, um, I I will send it to you as well. Oh, here we go. They changed their controls, so anyway, I just saved it. Um, thank you everybody for coming. It was so nice to see people from all over. And to recognize some of the names and faces, that's always fun. Um, For sure. I do I do have a question uh, based on what came up with your uh, Scrum Day in Madison. Who can I contact about that? Um, so Mary. Is this Mary? Mary Equal, e I-Q-B-A-L. Yeah. Yeah, it was Rebel Scrum. Oh, okay. Mailbox was full. Yes. Yes, that'd be great. Um, I'm I'm helping Mary a little bit. So yeah, we're looking for more, more speakers always. So have her email me, please. I will. I will I will I will do that her today. Mailbox, her mailbox was full. Um oh, okay. I will have her do that. 
All right. So again, thank you everybody for being here. It's like um yes, thank you. That's Esther, thank you so, so much for giving us your time and your yeah. expertise and sharing with us. And and um oh I would love to try some of your jams so we could do rest what is it reciprocity i can send you some <laughs> Dutch letters from pella and maybe you can send some jam. <laughs> anyway it was so great to have you here thank you so much for joining us at scrum masters of the universe and and to all of you who, who joined us as well thank you it's it's always a pleasure to see all of you here and and connect with you in in this way so enjoy the rest of your day um it's wednesday we made it halfway through the week so uh, yeah we're on the downhill slide have a great day everyone thank you so much right. thank you thank you. Bye -bye. thank you all thank you oh. esther jamie thank you. bye bye, bye.